following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Apollo, the Alpha and Omega of Alchemy. The Greek god and Roman god also, Apollo, is one of the most intriguing gods in uh, Greek Roman mythology. We are going to study it, or him, today, in order for us to understand how, from the point of Gnosticism, we understand who Apollo is, who actually is a god of, of actuality. Since when you read the, the book of Revelation, you find him appearing there in the chapter 9, where he appears as Apollyon. It is because in Greek there are many ways to write Apollo, Apollon, Apollyon, but here we wrote the Latin way in which we find Apollo. In one of the writings of Virgil, the poet of Mantua, master of Dante Alighieri, he said, Sicilian muses, let us take a loftier tone. Orchards and humble tamarisks don't give delight to all. And if we sing of woods, they should be worthy of a council. Now comes the last H of the Cumean song, the great order of the ages arise anew. Now the Virgin returns, and Saturn's reign returns. Now a new generation is sent down from high heaven. Only chaste Lucina favored the child at his birth by whom first of all the Iron Age will end and a golden race arise in all the world. Now your Apollo reigns, Virgil. Of course, this uh, uh, is only the first chapter of all that Virgil wrote related with uh, prophecy, in that many people in this day and age are commenting about. 
since Apollon, Apollo, or Apollon relates, of course, to Apollo, which in Latin is written with only the O at the end. That's why the title of the lecture is Apollo, the Alpha and the Omega. Because indeed, the letter Alpha appears at the beginning of his name and the Omega at the end of his name, which is pretty significant, Kabbalistic, alchemical. And we will see that. Of course, we find many uh, writings about this God. And we find in the secret doctrine by Madame Blavatsky the following. Apollo is Helios, the sun. Phoebus Apollo, the light of life and of the world, who arises out of the golden winged cup, the sun. Hence, he is the sun god par excellence. At the moment of his birth, he asked for his ball to kill Python, the demon dragon, who attacked his mother before his birth, and whom he is divinely commissioned to destroy, like Kartikeya, who is born for the purpose of killing Taraka, the two holy and wise demon. Apollo is born on a sidereal island called Asteria, the Golden Star Island, the earth which floats in the air, better said, in the space, which is a Hindu golden Hiranyampura. Hiranyapura. He is called the pure Agnopi or Agnus Day, the Indian Agni. And in the premial myth, he is exempt from all sensual love. He is therefore a Kumara, like Kartikeya. And as Indra was in his earlier life, And, bio and biographies. Python, moreover, the red dragon, connects Apollo with Michael, who fights the apocalyptic dragon, who wants to attack the woman in childbirth. See Re Revelation 12. As Python attacks Apollo's mother, can anyone fail to see the identity? For the way who understands the Bible lies through Hermes, Bel, and Homer, as the way to these through the Hindu and Chaldean religious symbols. The Secret Doctrine by Madame Blavatsky. Very interesting uh, quotation in which we find indeed that Apollo is the sun. But Many times, when people read mythology, they think that uh, mythology is pointing at the physical sun that we find as the center of the solar system, which is just the physical body of that which we call Apollo. Indeed, Apollo abides in the seventh dimension, or we can call zero dimension. It is the spiritual sun. In the tree of life, we find 
that it is divided by four worlds, or four manifested cosmos, or cosmoses, called Atziluth, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asia. Translated into English is the world of splendors, the world of creation, the world of formation, and the world of matter, which is at the very bottom related to Malkut. Of course, in this graphic, as you can see, we draw in the middle of the tree of life the seven chakras with the two serpents forming the caduceus of Mercury in order to point that that is a tree of good and evil. Because the tree of life and the tree of good and evil share the same roots, which are, are at Yesod, that means foundation. So, Apollo is what we call the spiritual absolute sun, which is above Keter, the first emanation of that sun that we talked in different lectures. And is related, of course, with the abyss, which is the space. But at, you see here, the bottomless abyss is an unfathomable abyss or chaos that is difficult or impossible to intellectually comprehend. There are three bottomless abysses, or unfathomable abysses, or pits, or chaos. That, the primeval macrocosmic chaos, or the creative sexual force of the world, of the world, out of which Kabbalistically is explained how the universe is formed. Yesod, the venerable microcosmic chaos of sex, out of which Kabbalistically is explained how the human being is formed as above, so below. And Klipos. The inferior Latin infernus, chaos, where the evolving egos dwell, hell. The subjective reasoning within the intellectual animal relates to this type of chaos where only disorder reigns. Obviously, the chaotic disorder of the subjective reasoning within this humanity is what creates the common and ordinary karma. The key of the bottomless pit represents the great arcanum in Yesod that unlooses the mystery of the abyss, klipos, and of the tree of knowledge, that that was locked by the original sin. The great arcanum grants us the conscious comprehension of these three types of abysses. Master Samael Onveor states, the mystery of the abyss is one of the unutterable mysteries of occultism. But we are in the time of the end. So we have to unlock the mysteries in order for us to understand the abysses, when you look up into the space, you discover that the space really is a big, deep, bottomless pit abyss. From that abyss that we call Ain, the Ain Sof, and the Ain Sof Or the solar absolute, or the spiritual absolute, emerges the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Tree of knowledge, precisely, which is the key in order to, in order to comprehend that. That's why that mystery of Sephira, that 
is always beneath the first triangle of the tree of light that relates with Atiluth, the world of splendors. Beyond that world of Atiluth, we find that that we call the Ains of Or, the origin of it, and that we call also the Solar Absolute. That is the spiritual sun that we are addressing. So, the physical sun that shines physically in this three-dimensional world is just the physical vehicle or the physical body. Or we will say one of the physical bodies of that spiritual sun. That is Apollo. Behold that his name begins with Alpha, which is the same Aleph in the Hebrew alphabet. That's why the three parts in which the absolute is divided begins with A, with Aleph. Ain, Ains of, Ains of, Or. Even the word or, Aleph, Bav, Resh, Aur, begins with Aleph, or with Alpha. That is pointing us that the origin of Apollo begins in the solar absolute. Because Apollo is called Phoebus, Apollo, the bright one. And of course, that light, that brightness, begins that, and is that we call the spiritual absolute sun. In Greek mythology, when we look at the space and see all the stars or physical bodies of that spiritual sun, it, what is, it is called Urania. Urania, the starry space, the feminine aspect of that space, but in the masculine aspect is Uranus. That's why in Greek, when you address the heavens, you say Urania or Uranus, the sky. And when you see the sky, you see all of those sparkling stars that are the physicality of that light that we are talking about. According to Greek mythology, the first uh, gods that appeared from the chaos, which is the same Uranus or Urania, is Uranus, Gia, and Eros. The God of love. That's the Trinity. Of course, that is what first appears before creation. As we understand uh, in Gnosticism, any solar system has a Maha Mambantara. In Amaha Pralaya, meaning a, cos a great cosmic day and a great cosmic night. So, before the creation of this solar system, what we see is the great cosmic night. That night is Urania, because in that dark space, you find other solar systems that are sparkling. And new solar systems are born. Similar to, in this moment, we will say, we are human beings that are physically active, 
in this three-dimensional world. But there are many human beings that will appear today, tomorrow, from the womb of any woman, the mother. So that's why the space is called the mother space, the Ain Sof, the mother space, where new solar systems are born. From this point of view, we are not uh, agree or do we disagree with that theory of the Big Bang that has started the whole universe in one point, in one zero time. We don't deny the zero time or the zero hour, but is particularly different to every solar system. That zero hour exists for our solar system, but is not the same zero hour for other solar systems. As I have an age, you have another age. You are in another time, and I am in my own time. See, whole humanity, different ages. And everybody comes from the womb. So from that point of view, we can analyze this and understand what a solar system is. In the same way that we are born from the womb of a physical mother, the solar system is born from the womb of the space. This is what in the Book of Runes is called the Rune Ur. And which is similar to the second letter of the name Apollo, which is the letter P. Amazingly, intriguingly, P show us the circumference of the circle. 3.1416, approximately. That is in geometry. So the letter P, that looked like the rune over, is also showing us the circle, the womb from where the light emerges. Do you see that, how beautiful this name is? And of course, the third letter, which is a Omicron, because in Greek there are two O's, the Omicron and the Omega. The Omicron means the small O, and the Omega, the big O. This, Small o, omicron, relates to our heart, physically speaking, and also to the sun, physical sun, that appears from the womb of the letter P. Coincidence that P means a circle, and O is another circle? No. It's telling us the mystery of Apollo. But let us leave it there at the half of his name in order to go deeper into the meaning of this God that we are studying here. So imagine that from that alpha appears the P, the letter P, which is the P in Hebrew that relates to the word To the mouth. And here, of course, we understand why the book of John says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. This is the beginning with God. We are, of course, addressing the alphabet. In this case, the Greek alphabet, as the Hebrew alphabet, are rooted in the runic alphabet. And this is why we understand all of this. So what God appears from that Uranus? Of course, according to the Greek mythology, we find that Saturn is the God that dethroned, or take the throne of Uranus, by neutered him. 
taking the testicles out of, of him. And he become with his size the new king of the, of the universe, which is just a symbol of the transition of this cosmic day coming from the space into manifestation. Because Saturn, as you can see here, relates to Bina. Bina, Gorians to Kabbalah, relates to Saturn. Matthew Samael says, and not only to Saturn, but also to Jupiter or Zeus, because Bina is a king, and Jupiter is a vibration that rules the kings. So we will say that Bina is ruled by two planets, Saturn and Jupiter. If you make the alchemical transition of this triangle, Keter, Chokhmah, Bina, which in Christianity is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then you take that triangle and place it in the middle column of the tree of life. Because Kabbalistically, it is stated that Keter rules the first triangle. Chokhmah, which is the second sephira, rules the second triangle. And Binah rules the third triangle. If we place Binah in the third triangle, in the center of the tree of life, in the middle column, obviously we will see that relates to Yesod. Yesod is foundation, relates to the sexual energy. And that's why it is stated Kabbalistically that the one that appears as a creator in the world of Atziluth is Saturn. From that point of view, because Saturn rules Yesod in the tree of life. And without the sexual energy, there cannot be any creation. So you find there why in theosophy it is stated that the first universe that appears in the Mahamambantara or Great Cosmic Day is the Saturnian round. That Saturnian round or first cosmic day relates, of course, to the first manifestation of the first triangle, which always we point relates to the head and to the mind. Because if we take the third triangle that relates to Bina, we place Netzach in Keter, or in the first triangle, then Hod in the second triangle, and Yesod, of course, in the third triangle. So Netzach, which is the mind, is related to the first triangle from the Bina point of view, or from the Saturnian point of view. That's why Master Samael on the Earth states that the Saturnian epoch was related with the mind. But we have to understand the tree of life and every alchemical element in order to understand what is he talking about and what all the masters talk about, the Saturnian epoch, the mind. But when we know the relationship of Bina with the third triangle in Asiluth and how the mind enters through his power, then we understand who Kronos, time, Saturn is. That's the beginning of the Maha Mambantara, which is always divided in seven cosmic days. It is stated that we are now in the fourth cosmic day of the great Mahamambantara. 
The second cosmic day is, of course, called the solar round and relates to the manifestation of Chokhmah. That if you know astrology, you know that Chokhmah, the second aspect of the first triangle, which is called the Christ, is ruled by Uranus. So we all hear how this light from Urania make that transition on unfoldment into the universe. It is always stated that Chokhmah has his center of gravity in Tifereth. Tifereth means splendor. And that's why it is translated also as beauty. Because the splendor of that light is beautiful. But the real translation of Tifereth is a splendor. That's why we stated that Asiluth is a world of splendors. Many parts of that Tifereth related with Chokhmah, which in us relates to the heart. So, of course, as you see, the gods, the Olympian gods, the throne, Saturn, and they appear in the universe, in the solar epoch, which is called the solar round. Master Samael on the Or explains to us that in the second round, in the second cosmic day, when that light was descending into the universe, of course, the universe appeared at a different level. He stated there that at that time, Jesus Christ, the Master of Eramento, this great Maha, or we said uh, Paramarta Satya, was the great initiate, the highest of the solar epoch. And in that epoch, in that cosmic day, was when all the archangels that we know in uh, uh, the Hebrew mythology appear or developed. The archangels of this day and age come from this epoch, which is the second round. And we are just touching because we talk about that in other lectures. But with this point, what I want to point at this moment is that the Saturnian epoch, here the first, is in the mind. And the solar epoch is in the heart, at the level of our heart. And Christ, Master of Elemento, Jesus Christ, is this a higher initiate at that level. It was the highest of all of them. But Samael on the or also is from that epoch. And all the archangels that rule now this solar system of this present cosmic day, which is the fourth. We're talking about the second. So let us understand that in order to comprehend who Apollo is, according to Greek mythology. Because Apollo is related to the sun. And here, the highest initiate was the master of Eramento, Jesus Christ. And that's why in Greek mythology, many great initiates associated Apollo with Jesus. It was not a coincidence. It is because they knew that this great being comes from that epoch of our, our Mahamambantara, a great cosmic day. Of course, after the manifestation of this round, appeared the third round that we call the lunar round, which we call it lunar because it's ruled by Yasad, who rules, is ruled by the moon. 
In that past cosmic day, the great initiate, the highest, was the Lord Jehovah. So now you understand, Jehovah is in the third, the Master Jesus, or Master of Ramento, is in the second. The first, the Master talks about that in the book, The Revolution of Beelzebub. Little with the mind, the laws of the mind. And of course, below in this graphic, you find the earth, Malkut, the world of Asia, which means matter and formation or action. This is the fourth manifestation. So we inherit one, two, three cosmic days in order for us to be here in this physical, three-dimensional world. And as we always taught in every cosmic day, nature recapitulates the former manifestations. That's why when we talk about the present manifestation, our present cosmic day, we talk about seven root races. The three first relate to the recapitulation of the first round, second, and third round. And those root races is what we call the polar ray, race or protoplasmatic rays, then the hyperborean rays related to the sun, and the Lemurian rays related to the third round, the lunar round. Our terrestrial epoch began in Atlantis, the first manifestation of this fourth round, Atlantis. That's why when we talk about Lemuria, Hyperborea, and the polar epoch, that's very ancient. Ancient times. The point is this. When you study Greek mythology, you find that Apollo is always associated with Hyperborea. The second root race. They don't associate Apollo with the first, but with the second. Of course, when you look at maps of Hyperborea, because there are many, this one that we found in the internet show us in the center the North Arctic, or the Pole, North Pole. And around that North Pole, hip Hyperborea. That continent, which is very uh, mentioned very often in the Greek mythology. Hyperborea means beyond Boreas. Boreas is the god of the north wind, the north wind god. And of course, the north, god, uh, north wind god, as you know, is there to the north, to the North Pole. In Greek mythology, you find that Apollo used to live, Delphi, a lot of those sanctuaries, temples that the Greeks had at that time. And then he says that he was going to his favorite land, Hyperborea. And he stood there for half a year to return after to the Greeks to say, okay, I didn't forget you. But he enjoyed to be there. If you study the movement of the sun in relation with the earth, you know very well, if you go to Alaska 
or to any land around the pole that the sun endures there half a year. He lives in his darkness for half a year too. So you, you, do you see here the relationship of that and why the sun enjoys those lands around the North Pole? The polar lands, or what in this day is called the Poland. Poland. There is a country named Poland, as you know. But that has the name of what in ancient times were called all the lands around the pole. The pole lands. We relate with those pale people. No color. Because they're high in the north, in the ice. They didn't receive too much sun for six months. Waiting for that marvelous time when the sun was going to shine for six months. Apollo. And that's why Apollo is called the god of the Hyperboreans. Of all those lands. That if you see in the map, you find here Asia, which is of course Russia. Are you called that uh, ice lands uh, in, uh, in Russia? Siberia. Siberia. Here's Canada. And uh, even California. Of course, at that time. Not all the whole California was, but was part, you know, of those lands that were around the North Pole. In other lands like England, Greenland, etc. And that's why you find in mythology many uh, stories, legends, about these uh, Hyperborean people that existed in the second root race. When we study the story of Atlantis, which is the very beginning of our round or terrestrial manifestation in this cosmic day, it is stated that the gods, the Elohim, tried to make a nice race that will help this root race, which we call the Aryan race, because we come from the Atlantis. All the universal flood stories relate to Atlantis. At that epoch, it's stated that Hyperboreans, survivors of the second root race that still existed in that area, that we call the Nordic area or the Nordics, mixed themselves with the Atlanteans in order to originate the Shemites. So the Shemites are the outcome of the Hyperboreans or the Nordics with Atlanteans. And the Shemites are the root of our present Aryan race after the universal flood. So those people which are ignoramuses that point at anybody in this day and age call it anti-Semite, of the Shemite. This is impossible. All of us are coming from the Shemites. Different races, different cultures. And, uh, of course, the main point here is this. That the plan was to give the physical body in the Shemites root to this great Hyperborean, or we will say solar god that was the highest initiate in the solar epoch. And that's why the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth was not 100% Jewish. And historians talk about that. Of course, 
was a mixture of Hyperborean with Shemites, or with, with Jewish race. And that's why uh, initiate that knew about this painted always Christ or Jesus Christ with blue eyes and white skin, referring that his father was Nordic and his mother was, of course, Mary or Miriam, a Jewish woman. From that point of view, you understand why is the book of Revelation, from the very beginning, talking about Alpha and Omega. The book of Revelation doesn't start that Jesus said in his manifestation to him, I am Aleph and Tav. He doesn't say that. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And he said it twice. But pointing... I am that being that was the highest initiate of the solar epoch. And that in this cosmic day, in the terrestrial manifestation of terrestrial cosmic realm, uh, appeared the, uh, the solar epoch as the Hyperborean epoch, recapitulation of that solar epoch. And of course, that's why John, the divine, the writer of Revelation, talks about Alpha and Omega. And Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letters, as you know, of Apollo. And the second letter is the P which is the circle of the sun, the O, which relates to our heart. And then the two lambdas, or how you call the two lambdas, are the two L's in Latin. This letter that looks like an N, is not an N, is a L, double L. And that double L derives from Lamed in Hebrew. And you know, we talked about Lamed many times. That relates to the heart. There are two. Because in order to work with alchemy, we need two forces. The heart of the man and the heart of the woman. Right? So you see that. Because in many lectures we stated that Lamed relates to the heart. The O is the vowel that you vocalize for the heart. P is a circle, which is an O. And Omega at the end is another. It's pointing us directly and very clear who Apollo is. He's not, of course, uh, as people think, an idol. It's an archetype. An archetype that relates to all the cosmoses. The force of the heart. So the two L's relates to the heart of the woman and to the heart of the man. In alchemy. And that's why the word pol, pol, in the middle of alpha and omega, in Greek, means much or many. Because in between the beginning and the end, there are many manifestations of that light, of that force, of that God. This is a Greek mystery. Of course, in other cultures, in other races, this sun god is called in different names. Suya is called in India. But let us continue with this Greek mystery. When you understand the mystery of this root race, as we explain it here, 
We understand this quotation by Master Samael on Veor that goes deeper into this mystery. He says, In the times of Abraham the prophet, the spiritual absolute between brackets, sun, acquired a beautiful harvest of solar men. During the first eight centuries of Christianity, another small harvest was reaped. In the Middle Ages, a few more. Presently, the spiritual absolute sun is performing the last effort. It has been working its last effort because the, because the perverse uh, humanity of this present century has become an enemy of the solar ideas. This humanity is terribly materialistic, mechanical, and 100% lunar. This is why the spiritual absolute sun is now making a last effort. It is trying to get a small harvest of solar men. Later, once the harvest is ready, the spiritual absolute sun will destroy this root race because it is no longer useful for its experiment. What is this race useful for? There is already no reason for the existence of this race. It is not useful for the solar experiment. This humanity is made up of people that have no interest in solar ideas. This root race thinks only of their bank accounts, of new cars, of the actors and actresses in Hollywood. These are people who only want passionate sexual pleasures, drugs, etc. Obviously, this humanity is not useful for the solar experiment. People like these have to be destroyed. And this is what the spiritual absolute son is going to do. The spiritual absolute son will destroy these people and will create a new root race in new continents that will emerge from the bottom of the ocean. Samael on the Or. As you see, Apollo is also called the destroyer in the book of Revelation. But people always associate Apollyon with a demon. But the book of Revelation states very clear. And they have a skin, an angel of the abyss. It doesn't say a demon of the abyss. It says an angel of the abyss. Whose name in Greek is Apollyon. It's Apollo, the same Apollo. The thing is this, Matthew Samael explains very clearly. When the sun loses any interest in the race, it's destroyed and creates a new one. Because the objective of creation is to create solar men, individuals with awakened consciousness. If you talk about this outside there to humanity, they don't care about that. This humanity is re really lost. Rare are those that listen to the solar ideas. Rare are those that listen to Apollo. So Apollo indeed is like this uh, god Shiva of the Hindu pantheon, who is creator and destroyer. Of course, the soul cannot be destroyed, but the physical body, the mentality, the, the, sentimentalism, the sentimentalism that we have could be destroyed, annihilated. All of that that we think that we are. The poor soul is bottled up within that ego that even crystallize in this physical world. Humanity is identified with the lunar aspect, Nahemad and Lilith, the two lunar aspects. 
and rare is that one that is trying to enter into the solar aspect of the matter. Of course, as Madame Blavatsky explained, Apollo is the same Michael. You know that Michael is the archangel of the sun. Michael means he who is like God. That's solar force. And Michael has that me. We're talking of the lecture. Who is who? That's why Michael means who is like God, like El. Any solar system has, of course, a logos to exist. Many times we talk about Christ as the logos, the word. But when we talk about this, people always associate and think that Christ is only related to the sun. But we explain in other lectures that all the planets are part of the sun. That's why when we study the tree of life, we study all of the sephiroth in relation with the sun. It is written in the book of Revelation that Alpha and Omega relates to the seven bowels or the seven churches or the seven candelabra candela uh, candlesticks in the right hand of the Lord. It is because the Lord is light but is related to seven spirits. You see, in his dis de descent into the matter, divides in seven. And moreover, into twelve. Because remember that the seven spirits behind the throne of God will relate to this solar system is the highest family, we will say, of Logoi that many times we named in many lectures. Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, Michael, Samael, Zahariel, and Orifiel. Those are the main seven because they are the head of the seven rays of creation in this solar system. But there are other Logoi, of course, related to the other planets because in the total account or amount, we will say, of planets that this solar system has is 13. So we hold here the symbol of Christ with his 12 apostles in relation with the solar system. But also in the Bible, we talk about the 12 tribes. But in many lectures, we said those tribes are related to the zodiacal belt, the 12 constellations or groups of stars that form the zodiacal belt in our solar system goes around. It travels around. Every constellation, a group of stars, is called in the Bible a tribe. A tribe of lights, of splendors. In total, it is called the tribes of Israel. Related to the light. To the same light of Apollo. Because each one of them, of those lights, of tribes, influence humanity. Those 12 tribes are called the 12 zodiacal signs under what we are born. So we receive the light of those 12 tribes. We receive the light also of the 12 apostles or 12 planets, Ologoi, 
and we belong to any of the seven races of that that we call Christ, which is a multiple perfect unity or light. And of course, the highest among all of those sparks is the Master of Ramento, who is a Paramartha Satya, a being that abandoned the abode of the Ain in order to appear in the solar system to help this terrestrial humanity. That's why when we name Master Jesus, Master of Ramento, it's a very high, very high being. And of course, we know that he is that being that represented Apollo or Christ or Surya or the solar god Christ in in Greek, the Messiah is indeed uh, a great symbol. Here, we find another quotation from Isis Unveiled from Madame Blavatsky that tell us about that solar fire which of course is symbolized here in this graphic with the ten sephiroth and the tree of good and evil in the middle because really Apollo is the one that unleashes the mystery of the tree of good and evil. As good, he is creator. As evil, he is a destroyer. But it's not a person. It's a force. It's a solar energy. It depends how we use it. It's the origin of the gods. Madame Blavatsky states, The advent of Apollo's solar fire transforms us radically. It is, said Madame Blavatsky, the chaos of the ancient, the Zoroastrian sacred fire, or the Atash Beran of the Parsis, the Hermes fire, the Helmes fire of ancient Germans. The lightning of Sibele, the burning torch of Apollo, the flame of the altar of Pan, the inextinguishable fire in the temple of the Acropolis and in that of Vesta, the fire flame of Pluto's helm, the brilliant sparks on the hats of the Dioscuri, on the Gorgon head, the helm of Pallas, and on the caduceus of Mercury. The Egyptian Patara, the Grecian Zeus, Kataibates, descending from heaven to earth according to Pausanias. The Pente Pentecostal fire tongues, the burning bush of Moses, the pillar of fire in the Exodus, and the burning lamp of Abraham, the eternal fire of the bottomless pit, the Delphic oracular vapors, the sidereal light of the Rosicrucian Gnostics, the Akasha of the Hindu adepts, the astral light of Eliphas Levi, the nerve aura and the fluid of the magnetists. The Ode of Rechenbach, the Psychod, and the Etheric Force of Thuri, the Psychic Force of Sergeant Cox, and the Atmospheric Magnetism of some 
naturalists, galvanism, and finally, electricity. All these are but various names for many different manifestations or effects of the same mysterious, all-pervading cause, the Greek archaeus. So, that is what Apollo is. It's energy. That's why it is stated that those that were worshipping Apollo were priestesses and priests, or priestesses and priests, that knew the mystery of the trio of good and evil. That's why in mythology it is stated that Apollo was the son of Zeus, Jupiter, with Leto. This Leto is also Leta, which means wife. And from that comes the word Leda, that goddess, that Zeus. Uh, seduced in the form of a swan. Many state that Leda took also the shape of a swan in order to receive Zeus. And that reminds us, of course, the swan, which is a beautiful bird, white bird, which is ready with love. And white bird reminds us also the white dove of the Holy Spirit that fecundated Mary. Same myth, which is nothing but an allegory of those alchemists that work with the two forces that we call Ava and Aima, within. When we start working with Ava and Aima, we have to go to Hyperborea, beyond the Boreas, beyond the wind, the north wind. Do you realize that when you breed, you are using your north, the top of your head? That is the wind. What is beyond your breathing or your breath, your lungs and your nose? Is a Hyperborea. There is when the son of Apollo appears in the Sahasrara chakra. And from then, that spiritual bird called white dove of a swan descends into your matter when you are pure, like a swan, like Leda, we will say it. Because in this case, Leda represents your physicality. That start being purified. And when your physicality is purified, and then you receive that beautiful swan. And in the case of Mary, that was chaste, and he received that swan. But that Mary represents your physicality. Because bef before Mary being the Virgin Mary, he is Mary Magdalene. Magd Magdalene, or the priest of. Uh, because mag is priest or priestess. A priestess, in this case, your physicality, that it start working and annihilate your seven capital sins in order to become virgin. But that process of chastity, of virginity, that we, we need to acquire is an alchemical process, long process. And when you finally are physically chased, then the white dove of the swan, Zeus, come and fecundate you and insert into your heart Apollo, the solar god, Christ, in other words. And this is what happened to the alchemists that follow the rules of alchemy. They long for the incarnation of Christ, for the incarnation of Apollo. 
which in this day and age is teaching through Samael on the or. Between parentheses, I remember now that Matthew Samael in one of his lectures states, and one of his books too, many Kabbalists state that Geburah, that is ruled by Samael, is ruled by Mars. And many try to be in contact with the Geburah through Mars, but they fail. Why? He says, because Geburah is ruled by the sun. It's also ruled by Mars, but mainly by the sun. We will say in this case that there are two suns in the heavens of the tree of life, Tifereth and Geburah. Two suns. That's why Geburah is an intuitional world, or the world of intuition. When we talk about Geburah, we talk about intuition. But people that do not have experience, direct experience, in the superior worlds with Geburah, they think that it's only Martian. But Mars ruled not only Geburah, but also Gedula, which is Chesed. And the sun rules also Geburah. Because there are two suns, especially in our physicality. The first sun relates to our heart with his systole diastole. Right? It's Tifereth. But there is a might that do that. And we, all, we always uh, state it. That's Geburah. It's might. It's that force that pushes the blood in all our physicality. So really, Geburah palpitates in all our physical body, in all the blood, which is red. That's why Geburah's uh, uh, color is red. But it's associated, intimately related, with Tifereth. So, that's explainable why the symbols that we find in the book of Revelation talk about Apollo and talks about the fifth archangel of spirit that descends from heaven with the key of the bottomless pit. And that, of course, is the key of the tree of good and evil. And that fifth archangel is Samael. But... John the Divine says, his name is Apollo. And then you said, and people that don't know alchemy and Kabbalah says, I don't understand. He's a fifth, but it's Apollo. And Apollo is the fourth. So what is this? You know, when you know alchemy, you know, it's, it's talking about the same force. But when you talk about Christ, it's not only the two forces, are seven forces. All the seven spirits are the same Christ. The same force that act in this solar system. And that's precisely the meaning of the tree of knowledge. Because the tree of knowledge of good and evil has two serpents. One solar and one lunar. Two forces. Much as Samael says, there are two suns in the space. Certain prophecies. I take that prophecy in relation with alchemy. And I see two suns, Tifereth and Geburah, because the two Sephiroth are ruled by the sun. When we take Tifereth, it is ruled by the sun and Venus. When I said that, I experienced precisely that uh, uh, Sephirah, Tifereth, and I saw that it was related with Venus and also with the sun. But then I understood. I said, well, before the sun rises, Venus appears here in this earth. And before the sun sets, Venus appears. So Venus and the sun are related. Tifereth or Venus and the sun are in Tifereth. But in Geburah, is not Venus. It's Mars and the sun. The might of Mars in Geburah and the sun as well. So there are two suns there related with our monad or the initiation. 
that we had to see and that we see when we are on the path. Two suns in the space. Not this physical space, but the psychological initiatic space inside of us. We see those two lights, the two suns. And that's why it is stated that the rider of the fifth uh, archangel that appears in the book of Revelation is a rider of a white horse. And that name is Samael, which is the same ruled by the, by the solar force, the sun. Then we understand here the returning of the forces in the Sephiroth in the alchemical manner in order to comprehend uh, the mystery of Apollo. Here we have the tetragrammaton, the pentagram, with the tetragrammaton, a powerful symbol of Christ. And behold how all the symbols relates to the seven spirits. In the arms of the tetragrammaton, we find Mars. In the feet, we find Saturn. On top of the head, we find Jupiter. And in the middle, we find Mercury and Venus. Those are uh, how many? And the sun here and the moon. The two polarities. The seven spirits. Synthesized in the pentagram. That's why this is a symbol of Christ, very powerful. And with the symbol of the elements. We will say the five elements. Ether, represented by the space there. Then the cup is water. The staff is the, the air. The sword is the fire. And the star of Solomon or David is the earth. But behold, that the tetragrammaton or the pentagram in this case has alpha and omega. The beginning and the ending. Omega is here upside down in order to point that the forces of sex which are there in the omega, which is a big O, is precisely, they have to go up through the caduceus of Mercury and by the forces of Venus. So this is what is between A and Omega, the many forces of the caduceus, alchemy. And this is what the pentagram teaches us. That's why when we said Alpha and Omega in the pentagram, well, we understand that the letter or the big O, the Omega, is in the sexual organs. In alchemy, we say, where can I find in my physicality <coughs> the solar absolute, that force that is the Alpha that descends in different levels and steps and finally crystallizes in my physicality. Where is it? That big O or omega is in the sex. There we will find our own particular solar absolute. That's why the law of the cosmic trogo auto egocratic states that all the forces that the solar absolute sends in the universe have to return back to him in order for that circle or circuit to continue in the space creating new solar systems. The energy descends from the absolute and returns to it. Solar absolute. That is circuit. Well, you can see the circuit of that light. So that light ends in the very center of the philosophical earth, which is called the physical body. And 
the very center of this planet also, which is the astral light, which is Christ. That's why in Delphi, you found the priestesses that were in a tripod in the middle of a well, bottomless pit that was coming with vapors from the earth. The priestess or the priest in great seer says, those vapors that come, come from the center of the earth, from the very ninth sphere, which is the astral light that is sent from the absolute. And that's why those priestesses were going into ecstasy when receiving that vapors into their physicality and were predicting things. And that's why they were called the priestesses of Apollo. Because the female body is more susceptible of receiving the forces as the earth is feminine. They call it uh, pythonies. Pythonies. How do you call it? Pythons. Pythonies, right? Pythons. Well, you know Python and, and right? It is stated that uh, when Apollo was born, the first thing that he did was to kill Python, the evil serpent. Or we will say it, the wrong crystallization of the astral light in us, which is called the Kundabafer organ. And this is the first task of Apollo, or Christ in us, to annihilate that Python. But the priestesses we call the Pythonesses, because they were predicting, but they were positive. So you see the aspect of that? The dragon and Michael killing the dragon, or, or Apollo killing the dragon. It's the same myth that uh, encloses the mystery of Apollo, related with your heart, because Apollo has two L's. That's why many uh, investigators, they say, that uh, Apollo was bisexual. If we take that turn 50 years back, we understand. But in this day and age, no. He was not bisexual because they polluted that word. This day and age, to be bisexual is to be a degenerate. To be really a bisexual is a hermaphrodite. Or androgynous, meaning having the two polarities. Because the woman has the solar polarities and the man has the solar polarities. Right? Feminine and masculine. And that's why Apollo was androgynous. But not only Apollo, all the gods of the Olympus were androgynous. All the Sephiroth are androgynous. And that's why when Abba and Aima, father and mother, our own particular jaw, Chava, the jaw, the positive, and Chava, the feminine. You know, Chava means Eve in Spanish, or I mean in, in English, in Spanish is Eva. But these two, Jahava, are related to the androgynism. To the two polarities that we're talking in many lectures about it. These are the two L's of Apollo that is lamed related to the heart, the heart that know alchemy, the heart that know the knowledge of good and evil. And the great omega means the transmutation to the caduceus of Mercury. And who's Mercury? Well, Mercury is also Shiva. The mercurial force, or the alch that matter that we have to transform, because there are many types of mercury. And thanks to love, which is Venus here in the center of the pentagram, is how we transform the brute mercury, which is called the zemen, into energy, in order to have the soul of the mercury. And to the soul of the mercury, then we unite and awake the third type of uh, mercury, which is the fecundated mercury. It's called sulfur. And when we achieve that, we create inside of us, with the power of the sun, of course, the solar light, 
our inner solar bodies, which is what the sun wants. But he utilizes all of his seven spirits in order to do that within. You see, it's not just the sun, but all the seven planets around you and all the 12 constellations doing that work within you when you enter into the path of alchemy. But all of those are ruled by Apollo. That's the mystery. Because we explain in other lectures about uh, Apollo that uh, is a Greek god, right? In the book of Revelation states about that Greek god In this way, we quoted this from the book of Revelation. Inside this quotation, we find this beautiful painting of Michelangelo. A coincidence? No. He says, I am Michelangelo, the angel Michael. So I'm going to put there uh, Apollo, you see. Apollo pierced by the cross. Because this is what is Christ. He works with the cross. The cross is the masculine phallus and the horizontal vagina. Connected is the lingam yoni of the, of, of the Greeks. In order to awake the fire. And here, of course, the virgin. Between parentheses, Michelangelo, this great uh, painter of the 16th uh, chapel, he painted all of them naked, completely naked, even the Virgin Mary. But when those priests at that time came and saw what he painted, they were marveled. But I said, no, our Lord naked. And Michelangelo said, the truth is naked. No cover. And then he said, no, but this is whatever you know. These sanctimonious priests made all their painter to put that and cover the sex and to put Mary in that way. But they were completely naked. Like in the ancient Greek, you find Venus naked. Apollo, naked. And all of them are naked because this is a myth. It's showing you the truth. It's naked. When you cover it, this is what is humanity like, to cover the truth with lies. Well, unfortunately, we didn't find the naked Jesus. And this is the only one that we find. But uh, maybe somebody in the future will put the naked truth. Because Jesus says, I am the truth. And if you cover the truth with veils, then there is no truth. You don't see the truth. But we are unveiling that in order for you to see the truth. And he says, Behold, he, the son Apollo, comes with clouds. When I said clouds, it reminds me of the other lecture when we talk about the pillar of cloud that were guiding the Israelites in the wilderness and the pillar of fire in the night, the pillar of cloud during the day. So he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the son Apollo, the beginning, sunrise, and the ending, sunset, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice at the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. It's very clear. It's talking about Apollo. I am Alpha and Omega, said again. The son Apollo, the first and the last Shakti potential in what you see, write in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, the world of matter. 
Revelation 1. So, Jesus is a mysterious Hyperborean or solar God that manifested in this root race for this humanity. And that's why Christianity flourished in Greece. That's why Paul, which by the way, Paul is in between Alpha and Omega, Apollo. The Greeks were calling him Apollo. Because, of course, they recognize the solar light. But the name of uh, that great God that incarnated as Apollo was Yeshua, which means Savior in, in Hebrew. But in order to see the mystery of Jesus, it is very clear that the crucifixion, Pontius Pilate, that represents the mind, says, between parentheses, this is mine. In the future, many people will wait for the coming of this great God, solar God. But because they are blind and fanatic, they don't know the mystery of this Son of God, or Son of the Absolute, Apollo. So let us write in Latin, in Greek, and in Hebrew. So they can unveil the mystery of Jesus. But people go only into the Greek and to the Hebrew pantheon. They never go into the Greek, never into the Roman pantheon. And here we are going into the Latin pantheon and Greek pantheon in order for you to understand that everything has wisdom. Not only the Hebrew pantheon has wisdom. You find wisdom, Chochmah, Christ, Sophia. In the Greek pantheon, the Latin pantheon, the Hindu pantheon, everywhere because the solar light, Apollo, shines everywhere, but especially in the Hyperborea area. That's why the Polish people love uh, Christ a lot, right? Because they are uh, close to the pole. But not only the Polish, all of those European that come from the Hyperborea, right? And that's why the Nordics relate to it. And this is why you have to understand this mystery that we are unveiling here, that is for everybody. But you don't need to be pale and with blue eyes in order to work in alchemy. It doesn't matter what color is your skin and what color are your eyes. Because the true light shines within your heart which is always bright. And that is the point. And that is Apollo. And that's why Master Jesus wrote in Pisti Sophia, when he descended from the 13th Ian, Ain, down, he said, for this cause, I have chosen you verily from the beginning through the first mystery. Rejoice then and exult. For when I set out for the world, I brought from the beginning with me twelve powers. As I have told you from the beginning, which I have taken from the twelve saviors of the treasury of the light. According to the command of the first mystery. This then I cast into the womb of your divine mothers. When I came into the world. That is those which are in your bodies today. For these powers have been given unto you before the world. The whole world. Because ye are they who will save the whole world, and that ye may be able to endure the threat of the rulers of the world and the pains of the world and its dangers and all its persecutions, which the rulers of the height 
will bring upon you. For many times have I said unto you that I have brought the power in you out of the twelve saviors who are in the treasury of the light, for which, I ca for which cause I have said unto you, indeed, from the beginning, that ye are not of the world, I also am not of it. For all men who are in the world have gotten their souls out of the power of the rulers of the aeons. But the power which is in you is from me. Your souls belong to the height. I have brought twelve powers of the twelve saviors of the treasury of the light, taking them out of the portion of my power, which I did first receive. And when I had set forth for the world, I came into the midst of the rulers of the sphere and had the form of Gabriel, the angel of the Aeons. And the rulers of the Aeons did not know me, but they thought that I was the angel Gabriel. Better said, Geburael, the god of Gebura, in other words. You see, here is hidden Gebura and Gabriel is really Geburael, the god of Gebura, which descends from Gebura, which is the fifth Sephira. Down to Malkut, or we will say to Yesod, the sexual force. Because when we feel the sexual potency is Gebura, the one that given given to the male, sexual potency in order to have erection, and to the woman, sexual humidity. And that comes and descends from Gebura, which is that might that we were talking about, the solar force down to Yesod, the sexual force, in male and female. And that's why in Yesod, Gabriel, in Hebrew, is Geburael, the god of Gebura, or the mighty man. This is about Gabriel represented by the mighty male, or the mighty force. But that mighty force, Geburael, in the depth is Samael, the god of volcanoes, or the fire that is in the center of our philosophical earth, and also this planet. So, Master Jesus dictated this in the Pisti Sophia, that quotation that we read. is written here, you can find it in the Pisti Sophia, unveiled. And he is saying... We're talking about the first mystery. Who is the first mystery? It's Keter, the first emanation of the light. And of course, he comes with that first mystery from the very beginning. The very beginning is Barashith. In the beginning, God created. From that very beginning is from that where Jesus, or that Averamento, master of the light, came down with 12 saviors. Or 12 powers. In other words, Christ is 12. 12 forces. And that's why he chooses. Or he chooses, in other words, 12 apostles. But he explains that each one of them were part of him. Because all of us are part of the Lord. When you have... An experience with the Lord in the world of Chokhmah. You don't find there a personality that you will say, Oh, I experienced Chokhmah, the second Sephira that relates with the Son, with Christ. And I saw that Chokhmah is Jesus. No. If you concentrate in Jesus, you will see Jesus. But if you concentrate in Krishna, in Chokhmah, and then you will see Krishna. Personally, I meditated investigating Krishnamurti because Master Samael on the or states that Krishnamurti is one with the Glorian. 
He said, well, the only way to verify if it's true that Krishnamurti is one with the Gloria is to meditate in Hohma, concentrated in Krishnamurti. And then I had experience with Krishnamurti. But in that experience, I was Krishnamurti. Of course, Krishnamurti was still alive at that time. It's impossible to, to be two Krishnamurtis. But then I understood. I penetrated into the sphere of Hohma where everybody is one. And if you want to investigate who is Jesus, you will you see yourself as Jesus. You want to investigate who is uh, Zarathustra, you will see yourself as Zarathustra. And if you want to investigate, for instance, if I want to concentrate and investigate in you, in front of me, then I will become you. Because as he explains, all the, the souls emanated from him. But it's Christ the one that he's talking about. It's, it's Apollo, the solar light. All of us come from that light. Unfortunately, we are trapped. During, uh, within the matter. And that's why don't, we don't see that we all, all of us are one. The same force. So when we walk on the path, then we discover who this Apollo is. You want to experience and concentrate in Apollo in Hogma, and then you will see as Arjuna, when he was asking Krishna, Show me your universal form. And of course, Arjuna entered into samadhi, into ecstasy. And then he saw the universal form of Krishna, which were thousands of individuals in him. And it is because in Christ, everyone is one. And that's why the Master explains that. Of course, the main forces are those forces that already became one with him. The seven Logoi in the solar system already became one with him. The 12 constellations and all the stars that, sh that shine in the zodiacal belt already became one with them. And that's why they are shining. If we follow the path, eventually, in the future, we will be another star in the space. But right now, we are darkness. And our earth is emptying with that form, alchemically speaking. We have to work with these solar ideas in order to be born spiritually inside. And that is the treasury of the light. What is the treasury of the light? The ains of ore. That is the treasury of the light. The solar absolute. When we penetrate there, we discover the multiple perfect unity. But we are in the very bottom of that multiple perfect unity. You see here is the earth. And you work with the tree of good and evil, the tree of knowledge here in the middle of the, of the pillar of the middle of the tree of life, you eventually will become a solar man. Solar man is someone that developed within the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil and became one with Apollo. So now you understand why in this day and age, in the chapter 9 of Book of Revelation, is stated that start fall from heaven with the key of the bottomless pit. And that knowledge is the knowledge that we are given now. And his name in Greek is Apollyon. If you don't follow the rules, then he will destroy this humanity, which is lunar, but in the Hebrew manner which is in the left, which is Abaddon. Abba, the father, Adon, means mister. Or Adon, Adonai is the Lord. But Adon, for instance, in Israel, when they talk to you respectfully, he says, Adon, and then say your name. 
like in Spanish, we say Don Juan, right? In Hebrew, it's Adon, Abba Adon. Everybody here is identified with Abba Adon, going down, because there are two ways. The lunar way, Abaddon, and the solar, which is obvious, is Apollyon or Apollos. Do you have questions? Okay. So um, earlier in the lecture, we, uh, uh, I, was, I was getting things a little, uh, a little mixed up here. I was wondering if you could, could clarify this. So um, you talked about how Saturn uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, neuters uh, Uranus uh, to start the, uh, that's the, that sim uh, symbolizes the, the Saturnian round emerging out of the, uh, out of the absolute at the beginning of the, uh, the cosmic day, right? So, and then in the, the next round, the solar round, it's Uranus again, because it's a uh, Hokma rules the solar round, um, and uh, uh, Hokma is Uranus. So there's, is there a relationship between the Uranus of the, the solar round and the Uranus get, that gets uh, castrated <coughs> by, uh, by Saturn at the beginning, or is that, are those compl two completely different uh, instruments? It's an unfoldment. Okay. An unfoldment. Let me drink a little bit of water. Nobody offered me water during the lecture, <laughs> so I had to serve myself. Anyhow, Uranus, you have to understand, rule the sexual glands. Yes. Mm -hmm. So even now, <coughs> we are ruled by Uranus in the age of Aquarius, because Aquarius is ruled by Uranus. Yes. So understand Uranus. The dissension of Urania, of Uranus in the chaos, which is called chaos, different chaos of abysses that we explained here, right? <coughs> and they said, this unfoldment of that force, Christic force, from the absolute to the solar, to the lunar, to the terrestrial. All of those forces are, uh, Uranus is always there, but in different levels. Meditate in that, and you will see it more clearly. Here. I, I have, like, three questions. <coughs> They're all related to, I think, <coughs> points in different directions. Like, the case of Avalokiteshvara. How do you use the word Avalokiteshvara? Is that the same thing? Avalokiteshvara. Yes. Avalokiteshvara is another manifestation from the Buddhism or Taoism, right? Kuan Yin. Avalokiteshvara is represented with many hands and many arms. It's the same manifestation, the universal manifestation of the Lord in that uh, particular pantheon. And it's the same as the spiritual aspect. Yes. It is. My other question is Ain Sof, the same as uh, what uh, HTE refers to in its introduction as Indo Sufism, or is that yet another, not the same? <coughs> yeah, the Ain Sof is a Mula Prakriti, or the root of Prakriti. Of course, the Ain Sof. That's why we will say this is a feminine aspect. All the universes emerges from the Ain Sof and return into the Ain Sof. That's the Maha Mambantara and the Maha Pralaya relates to this complete circle that begins in the Ain Sof. This is all the manifestation of the matter, which is the Mula Prakriti and the different Prakritis because. In Gnosticism, we study five aspects of the Divine Mother related with the pentagram. And the first aspect is precisely Mula Prakriti. The, the last question I had was of the term Gabura, um, and you related that to uh, the blood in the physical body. And I also wanted to know if Gabura is also related to willpower. Yeah. Will, 
<coughs> is a Martian, yes, yeah, willpower, but also solar, right? Gebura is the mind. That's what Gebura of the solar force, in, but it's also related with Mars because it's related to Elohim Gibor. You see, in the world of Asiluth, it's called Elohim Gibor, the positive ray of Mars. Or Elohim Gebur, Gebura, right? The gods of Gebura. And, and yes, of course, that force descends and gives us sexual potency. When we transmute the sexual potency, the sexual energy, and then willpower develops in us. In the beginning, we are very weak because we are accustomed as animals to spill the sexual solar force. But when we begin to transmute the sexual solar force, and then that will that we have, which is very weak, strength, strength, strengthens and uh, increases. And our willpower becomes almighty right at the end. And this is what uh, your particular individual God wants. Might, willpower. That's why in Gnosticism we said, our motto is te le ma, which is a Greek word for willpower. And that's our motto, yeah? In, the, in, in this aspect, yeah, is the womb, which is feminine, but also has to be fecundated by the Ain. The Ain of or in this case, sun. using is the sun. Okay. Not only the S O N, but also the sun, S U N, the solar absolute. So the Ain is, would be masculine in this case. Yeah, in this case, but uh, in the. In the absolute, we cannot talk about these two polarities because the absolute is beyond polarities. But the manifestation of the two polarities come from the absolute. And obviously, the aims of or, which we call the solar absolute, is the sun. Or the first manifestation, which is the light, is the, what we call the protocosmos, the first cosmos, but which is not visible through the telescopes because it's in the unknowable divine. It's a city which is called Christ in the seventh dimension. And from that uh, comes creation, or the manifestation that we call the Saturnian epoch, the solar epoch, lunar epoch, and now where we are in the terrestrial epoch. So in, in the Mahapalaya, nothing returns to the Ain except for the, the uh, feminine Yeah, everything returns to Ain Sof. Well, uh, yeah, like Jesus, but uh, the, in order to enter into the Ain, you have to win the right. So, so the and in order to win the right, you have to, to help different humanities through different cox, cosmic days. Because this is the law of Christ, sacrifice. When you finally sacrifice yourself, but not you, but the, let's say uh, those beings that are at that level. Then they gained the right to enter into the Ain. Jesus gained that right long time ago. But he abandoned the Ain in order to come and help. To show us the way, because he already is there. When this planet will disappear, he is ready to go with no problem into the Ain. While other gods are trying to enter into the 13th Ain, or the Ain. Most of the gods that appear in this cosmic day belong to the Ain Sof, the 12th Ian. So we would say that the Divine Mother is the Ain Sof, not, yeah. not the Ain? The Divine Mother is the Ain Sof, the unmanifested Divine Mother. They were physical. We're physical, but not in the sense that we are right now, because they were the first manifestation. But there is always the, the same manifestation that we talk here, of course, in all the levels. But when we said physical, we talk about matter, right? But that matter is not like our matter. It it's very subtle. So the, the archangels did the work in different dimensions? 
Well, uh, we need to meditate about that in order to comprehend every cosmic day. Because there is always physical matter in all of these uh, realms, but at different levels. You see, the level in which we are right now, which is the terrestrial level, is a very dense, gross physical matter. Right? But we think that life only expresses in the three-dimensional world. But physical life, for instance, resurrected masters exist in the fourth dimension, which is not three-dimensional. It's a fourth. It's tetra-dimensional. And they are physical. But that physicality that they have is immortal. We have a mortal physicality because we are fornicators. But there are other physicalities that are very high, that are incomprehensible, incomprehensible. That's the word. This is a very long word for us. One more question. Yeah? The white horse is the physical, uh, the physical matter. Purified. Purified, of course. Purified. That means that he controlled the physicality very well. You know, a white horse, a wind horse, controlled by the being. And that's the symbol of Pegasus or the unicorn. White horses. The horse always represents the equine, the animal with four legs. And those four legs are Netzah, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. That we have to control. So can be a, a symbol of all of the body purified? Yeah. White. Right? But also in the book of Revelation, they talk about four horses. The white, the black, the yellow, and the red. It also related to the four lower sephiroth in different manners. One needs to know how to read the book of Revelation because it's an alchemical, Kabbalistic book, very deep. So deep that nobody understands it. Good. <laughs> because they didn't touch it, you know. All the books of the Bible are adulterated, but the book of Revelation, they don't dare to do it because they don't understand it. <laughs> yeah? So on the, on the slide that had uh, the, the paintings and the, the two chapels, uh, yeah. Well, we have to understand that, uh, as we show in the graphic, the tree of knowledge of good and evil flourishes. You see, that is here in the larynx, at the level of the throat. That is the sephira of the mystery, related to the Vishura chakra. And that knowledge is given to you, for instance, right now, I am giving you that knowledge thanks to my tongue. Without tongue, I cannot talk. But my tongue, in this sense, is double-edged sword. Because I'm telling you the truth. The left side is hidden, but the right is unveiled with the light. That's the meaning of the double-edged sword. The one that has the power to unveil things at his level. Because the myths that are written in all the books, sacred books, are hidden in different levels. We are unveiling this from the level of Samael on the or. The fifth ray. Because we belong to the fifth ray. Yes? Yeah, the double-edged sword is the two truths of, of Buddhism. 
the one that awakens of see, see the naked truth, the absolute truth. But those that are on the path see in different levels. Those that are completely blind only read the dead letter and don't understand what they're reading. The what? Nietzsche, philosopher Nietzsche, yeah. talks about Apollonians and the Dionysians as being opposed. Do you know if that's related? Well, it's what Nietzsche says, right? The Apollonian means related to Apollonius of Tiana, right? We relate, of course, to this truth because Apollonius was a disciple of Apollo. That's obvious with his name, right? And the other is, uh, you said, uh, what? Dionysius. Yeah, okay. uh, Dionysius is related to the mystery of good and evil, the tree of knowledge, alchemy, the god of wine. The opposite, we will say, is Bacchus. You know? Because in this day and age, people are uh, organizing bacchanalias, mm -hmm. right? Which, in which they abuse the god of wine and the sexual energy, which is the true wine that comes from, from, from the app. Master Jesus says, I am the wine, the, the blood. You have to drink the, the, the blood of Jesus. That is the soul of light, Gebura. And eat his own flesh. That is the sexual matter that we have that we have to transmute. You know, the sperm in the oven, that's the flesh of the solar light that crystallizes there and creates life. Right? Which is the mystery of the Eucharist, of course. But we don't have to go deep in that because we talk about that already in other uh, lectures. But that is, uh, we will say, the Bacchus, the opposite of Dionysius. And Nietzsche, he knew about this mystery. He knew about it. He talks in his Das Pax Zaratustra, very clear. But many people uh, misinterpret Nietzsche because he is very rough, but uh, very profound. Particularly, I, lo I love Nietzsche. He is Dos Pax Zaratustra. But many people uh, misinterpret Nietzsche. Because in order to comprehend Nietzsche, you have to awake and to be an alchemist. Otherwise, you don't know. From the beginning at the end, that book. And all the books of Nietzsche. That uh, he called himself the Antichrist. Right? Not that he was against Apollo or against Christ. The Antichrist meaning, I am against all your beliefs of what Christ is. And that is not Christ. So I am an Antichrist from that point of view. But if I explain what Christ is, then you see that really I am Christian. But not from the common and ordinary belief of Christ is. Because that idol has to be disintegrated in each one of us because we were taught about that from the beginning. The Catholic Church, they made a mess of the doct doctrine of Jesus. Another question? Can you elaborate a little further on, on uh, the significance of Jesus getting confused with Gabriel by the rulers of the eons? What do you think the rulers of the eons would know better? <laughs> well, the rulers of the eons are the laws of karma. Yeah. And they are in different levels. And of course, uh, uh, those rulers also are people in the earth that rule this humanity. And they uh, think that the angel Gabriel was sent, but it was the same Jesus, sent it to, to his own divine mother, right? Because the, the, the light of Christ has different parts. Matthew Samael says, the Lord has 49 levels, 49 parts, and even more. But the basic ones are 49. And we talk about just seven. The Trinity is what? The seven, the Epta, the 12th, the 24th, elders that appear in Revelation, there are more parts. And of course, the, the point that the Master Jesus says that I appear like Gabriel because 
If I see Gabriel, I know that he exists in the sphere of the Lord as one with the Lord. And not only Gabriel, Michael, Samael, Orifiel, Zahariel, and any archangel is one with the Lord. This is what we have to comprehend and understand. When we talk about the abyss, darkness, of course, there are different types of darknesses. When we talk about darkness of the, of the Ain, that darkness, which is between the first triangle called Dat, is a darkness because we cannot see it. But when we make light in the darkness, you see it. Now you know the light, the truth, there is no excuse. Right? But there is another type of darkness, which is degeneration, which relates to klipoth, hell. But it's the same energy, it's just trapped, right? It's, uh, uh, it's the same energy, not, it's not trapped. It's the energy that destroys the garbage. It's a, there's a recycling process there. All that matter that is, is no longer good is degenerate, it's, de, it's devolving. So Apollo, or the solar force there, destroys it. But in, I mean, in us, like in our own particular kipot, if we understand those elements, if we understand our own darkness. <coughs> if you understand your own darkness, your own kipot, your own hell. That turns into light. And then you liberate, not turns. The soul, as you read there, and the Master Jesus says in the Peace of Sophia, the soul is part of the light. But it's trapped. In other words, what another speaker says, you are looking to be what you already are. You know what I mean? The soul is light. You disintegrate the ego. What remains is light because it's part of the Lord. But if you don't disintegrate that which trapped the light, which is your soul, then nature will do it for you. And that's called hell. Hell is a recycling process in which the ego, that that we, hold, that we call my anger, my pride, my self-esteem, my vanity, my lust, my anger, all of that will be disintegrated down there in order to liberate the light, which is your soul. And when you meditate and comprehend what you are in the darkness, then the light is liberated when it is disintegrated. And you become... What you are. But it's a transformation of the darkness, isn't it? Because the energy can't really be destroyed. Because I mean, energy doesn't get destroyed. Because transformation of the darkness. What do you mean transformation of the darkness? Well, I'm saying it's energy. The light comes from the darkness. When you disintegrate that darkness, in this case, clipoth, that darkness becomes cosmic dust. But energy can't be destroyed. So isn't it the transformation of that energy back into light? Well, that, that energy that uh, uh, are forming your ego returns to the space, returns to what belongs, to nature. Because it's obvious that uh, we have mind, we have emotions, we have feelings, but that belongs to nature. Right? As it is written, you are dust and to the dust you have to return. That's the matter. Adama, as you call in, in, in the Bible. But your soul is light, pure light. And when you liberate that light, you become enlightened. But right now, we are in darkness. Remember that. Nature will take. Nature will take from you what belongs to it. And that's your ego. If you don't want to, for nature to disintegrate your ego down there, that belongs to nature, disintegrate it here. And give to nature that belongs to nature. Or what Jesus, the master of mental said. Give to Caesar that belongs to Caesar and to God that belongs to God. Thank you very much.
To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.